Okay, in this lesson we're going to learn one more thing uh, that you can do with functions, namely called the composition of functions, very important. And uh, then uh, we'll have uh, the next lesson will be on exponential functions and then we'll get into calculus proper. So um, recall that I said that um, you can think of a function as being like a machine in which uh, you stick something in and the machine does something to it and you get something out. And we could call this machine F, for example. So now we're going to allow this as a possibility. We're going to say, okay, this thing that comes out of F, before we look at it, we're going to put this thing on a conveyor belt, and it's going to go to another function. We'll call it G. And then it'll go into G, and it'll come out of G, and that's what we'll finally see. So uh, as far as we're concerned, we can think of this as being one big function which involves both of these two smaller ones. So let's think about what happens. X goes in here and F does something to it and F of X comes out. We don't see F of X though. It goes in here and what does G do? Well, look what G says. G takes anything and it it, take, it gives us g of that. So if you put an x in here, you get g of x out. If you put a star in here, you get g of star out. If you put a dollar sign in here, you get g of a dollar sign out. We're going to put f of x in there, so we're going to get g of f of x out. So there's the final thing that comes out of this function. So this whole function here, which is made up of these other two, it's called the composition of these other two, is what you get, as you say, by taking, by getting g of f of x. And you can either write it like that, or another way of writing it, which just gets rid of some of these parentheses, is to write it like this. g, and you put a little circle. g of f of x. So it just makes it clear that this is this is what you get by putting these two things together. You get g of f of x. So we make it clear that x goes into f first and then goes into g. So for example, if uh, f of x is equal to um, x squared minus 9 and g of x is equal to 1 over x, then what would this look like? Well, let's see. Here's the way I like to do it. I say g of f of x. In this case, f of x is x squared minus 9. And uh, so that's, so, so f of x is, let me tell you what, let me start that one more time. g of f of x is going to be g of, what is f of x? It's x squared minus 9. And then what does g do to anything? g takes what you put into it and it goes 1 over that. So it's going to be 1 over x squared minus 9. So that would be the function g of f of x. What if we wanted f of g of x? What would it look like given the fact that g and f are the same things as above? Well, let's see. That would be f of What's g of x? g of x is 1 over x. That's what g does. And now what does f do to anything? f takes that thing and it squares it. And then subtracts 9 from it. So notice that these two things, if you wanted to, you could rewrite this as 1 over x squared minus 9. So, uh, so f of g of x and g of, x, uh, g of f of x are totally different. There's no reason to think that they would be the same. So this one right here, you could write f composed with g of x. A little thing like this. This one is g composed with f of x. Okay? So this picture right here is, is g of f of x. Okay, so, uh, so that's composition of functions, and uh, that's all there is to it. And now let's take this and run with it a little bit. Let's ask this question. 
given a function f, what function would undo what f does? In other words, I want a function here that does the following. You put an x into f, this thing gets spit out, this goes into this function, and now this function takes f of x and it spits out the original thing x again, so you get x back again. That's what you want. So this would have to be a function that undoes what this one does. And we give that function a name. It turns out there's only one such function, so we give it a name. We call it f inverse. So f inverse is the function that by definition undoes f. So, so let me write it like this f inverse composed with f of x is what? It's f inverse of f of x. And either way you write it, they undo each other. You just get x back out again. If you want to think of a function as being like a... We haven't used this way of talking about functions yet, but you can talk about a function as being this rule that starts with things in the domain and sends them over to the range or the image. We mentioned those words. And so if this is what f does, if f takes things from the domain and sends them over here, then what f inverse does is just goes back in the reverse, reverse order. It takes this thing and sends it back there. So they just undo each other. They undo each other. And since they undo each other, that diagram would show that since this thing undoes f, f also undoes f inverse. That if you started with f inverse and first did this and then took f of that, you would end up with this thing again. So they undo each other as well. So let, let's, let me write it down like that. Basically, f composed with f inverse of doesn't matter what the symbol is there, x is equal to f of f inverse of x. They undo each other. Here you have an x there, f inverse of it is right here, f sends it right back to where you started. So they just undo each other. So that's the relationship between a function and the inverse of the function. The other thing you should notice from here, from this, is that the domain of f is the range of f inverse and the range of f is the domain of f inverse. See that? The domain of f, here's the domain of f, it's the range of f inverse and here's the range of f, it's the domain of f inverse, okay? So they uh, just take things back and forth. So that's well and good. Uh, how do the graphs of these things compare with each uh, to each to uh, each other? Let me get rid of this and draw an example. Let's start with the function uh, as an example. Let's start with f of x is equal to x cubed plus one. Okay, we know how to graph that now. Think about what x cubed is. x cubed is the function that looks like this. Remember that from a previous lesson. And if you add 1 to it, it just shifts it up. So there's x cubed plus 1. Now, we want the inverse of this. How do you find the inverse of a function? Here's the mechanical way to do it. Let me show you. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Here's what you do. You start with this. First of all, you put a y where the f of x is. So you have that. Just put a y right there. Now you, you replace the x and the y. So if you replace the x and the y, this is going to be x is equal to y cubed plus 1. Like that. Now you solve it for y. If you solve for y, you're going to get x minus 1 is equal to y cubed. And so y is equal to the cubed root of 
x minus 1. And that is the formula for f inverse. Right there. There's the formula. So that's all there is to it. Um, so if we were to graph that, what would that look like? Well, let's think about it again. Again, a little scratch work. Do you remember what the cube root of x looks like? It looks like this. And we know how to translate functions now. This is going to be the cube root of x minus 1. So basically, it shifts it over one unit here. So it's going to look something like this. And look something like that. So this is f inverse right there, which is given by this. Do you notice anything, any special relationship between those two graphs? Okay, there's a symmetry there. Notice that they are symmetric to this line y equal x. That's true for any function and its inverse. They're symmetric. Why is that? Because basically what it's saying is, is that if the point A, B is on this graph, then the point B, A is on that graph. They undo each other. If F sends A to B, then F inverse sends B back to A. So that's, let me say that again. If you have A right here, and F sends A to B, which means B is the Y value here, if it sends A, uh, a to B, then F inverse undoes it, it sends B to A. So you have to first find B on the x-axis, and there it is, and then it sends it back to A again. So, uh, so there you have it. Okay, so uh, that's all very important. We're going to be using this uh, for various functions. Um, one thing that um, you should realize is that, is that since it flips it over the line y equal x, not every function is going to have an inverse. Okay, let's think about it. If you started with the function f of x is equal to x squared rather than x cubed, what does this function look like? It looks like that. So if you flip that over the line y equal x, the graph would look like this. And we see that that's not a function. It violates the vertical line rule. So, um, so not every function have, has an inverse. The reason this one did is because not only is it a function, I'm talking about x cubed plus 1 now, not only is it a function, but notice that it not only satisfies the vertical line rule, it also satisfies the horizontal line rule. Any horizontal line is going to hit this graph at only one point which means that the inverse is also going to be a function. Since any horizontal line only hits this graph at one point, it means that any vertical line is only going to hit this one at one point. Look at here. This thing here is a function, no problem. Any, any vertical line only hits it at one point, but notice it does not satisfy the horizontal line test. A horizontal line hits this at two different points, and so its, it's uh, inverse would not satisfy the vertical line test. Basically, since, since both uh, uh, 3 and negative 3 both get sent to 9, this one has to decide where is it going to send 9? Is it going to send it to 3 or negative 3? So you have a problem. So, um, so in order to have an inverse, a function has to be what's called 1 to 1, which means that, that for any point in the range, there's only one point in the domain that gets sent to it. Here, for any point in the range, there's only one point that gets sent to it, not the case here. This one, in other words, satisfies the horizontal line test. This one doesn't. So if a function doesn't have an inverse, what you can do is to change the domain of the function. You can say, okay, let's, let's change the function and make the domain just from 0 to infinity. Now it looks like that, and now that it looks like that, we can go ahead and find the domain, we can find the inverse of that one, it looks like that. So from so at various times we're going to have to restrict the uh, domain in order to have an inverse. Let's do two other problems. 
just to give you a little more practice with inverses. First of all, uh, find exercise, find the inverse of uh, f of x is equal to 3x plus 2 over 4x minus 5. Okay? I like this problem because it tests your, uh, your uh, algebraic ability a little bit. If you remember the very first lesson, or the second lesson, I guess, we uh, had a little uh, review of algebra, and this is a nice example where you have to use that algebra. So what are the steps? First step is to just replace this with a y. So I might as well go through all the steps here. So uh, y is equal to 3x plus 2 over 5, I'm sorry, 4x minus 5. Second step is to repl uh, replace uh, the uh, interchange, I should say, interchange the x and the y's. So every place I see a, a y, I put an x. And every place I see an x, I put a y. So it's going to be 3y plus 2 over 4y minus 5. Now comes the hard part. We have to solve that thing for y. And I always think of, back when I was a kid, I'd have these little models of airplanes and cars that I put together. I'd get them in a box. And the first thing I had to do was break all the little pieces apart from the, the grid that they were on. And I'd break them all apart and get them all lit, uh, on the table. And then I, of course, glue them together as they should be. And it's very similar here. You basically have to kind of pull it apart, get it as broken apart as possible. Or if you have a crossword puzzle, same thing. Not a crossword, but a jigsaw puzzle. You pull the whole thing apart, and then you put it back together the way it should be. So the way to pull this all apart, the first thing we have to do is to get rid of this big old fraction that's here. And the way you can get rid of the fraction is by multiplying both sides by this denominator. So I'm going to go x times 4y minus 5 is equal to 3y plus 2. There, I made progress. I got rid of that big old fraction. Uh, I still have parentheses here, though, and that kind of pull, ties this thing together, these two things together. So let's get rid of those by, uh, by multiplying this out. I'm going to get 4xy minus 5x is equal to 3y plus 2. Now this is broken apart as much as it can be. Okay, All the pieces are, are, are separated as much as they can be. So now we want to put it back together in such a way that we have a y all by itself on one side and everything else on the other side. So this is similar to one of the problems that we did uh, on that little algebra uh, uh, practice. What you need to do is first get everything with a y in it over on one side. So let's go 4xy minus 3y and then everything without a y over on the other side. 5x plus 2. Now we're almost done. Remember the next step? We factor a y out of both of these. And I'm almost done. I guess I'm going to have to go up here, uh, divide both sides by this. And we get what? y is equal to 5x plus 2 over 4x minus 3. Okay, a good problem. Uh, this, this is a lot of good solid algebra here. And if you can kind of see the end from the beginning, you basically break everything apart, and then you put it back together, and uh, you get your final answer. So there's our f inverse of x right there. Okay, very good. Let's do um, two other problems, as long as we're talking about inverses. We've already talked about the trig functions, so let's talk about the inverses of a couple of those trig functions. Remember what the tangent looked like? Tangent looked like that, and it kept doing this over and over and over again. This right here was pi over uh, 2. This was negative pi over 2. 
And so it kept repeating that. So obviously the tangent was not a one-to-one -one function, okay? So if you were to flip that over the line y equal x, you'd get a whole bunch of things like this. It's not a function, okay? So I'm only going to draw one there. I only want one. By just having one of them, it is a one-to-one -one function, so I'm restricting the domain to be just between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And so now we can draw the, the uh, inverse. Here's the inverse right here. Can you imagine it in your mind? It's, I guess I just drew it. It's going to look something like this. Like that. Okay, and this is going to be negative pi over 2, right there. So, uh, so there's the graph of it, and then uh, recall that um, if you have pi over 4, the tangent of, of pi over 4 is equal to 1, and so the um, arc tangent of 1 is equal to pi over 4. This is the way that we express the inverse of the tangent. You actually have two choices. You can either write, write this, or you can write this. They're both, they're both accepted. Uh, your calculator will typically use this one just because it uses less space. I prefer this one because it's less uh, ambiguous. This could lead to just a little bit of conf confusion. Why is that? Because if if you wrote, if I wrote tangent to the negative fifth of x, that would mean 1 over the tangent to the fifth power. Okay, this would just mean to take the reciprocal. And so when you see this, it can be a little bit confusing. Do you mean the reciprocal, 1 over the tangent, or do you mean the inverse? The reciprocal and the inverse are two different things. Okay, totally different. So just in order to avoid confusion, I like to use the word arctangent for the inverse, to, to stand for the inverse. Okay, as I say, that's just another, another uh, word that's used. So, uh, so there you go. So the arctangent of 1 is equal to pi over 4. In other words, in other words, if you stick pi over 4 into the tangent, you get 1 out. And if you stick 1 into the arctangent, you get pi over 4 out. They just undo each other. Okay? Let's do the same thing with the sine. Um, that's the last one that we should probably look at. Recall that the sine looks like this. And notice that it's not one-to-one. -one. It doesn't satisfy the horizontal line test. Uh, how much of it can we include in order to satisfy the horizontal line test? From here, negative pi over 2 to here, pi over 2, everything is good. And as soon as you pass this point, it starts folding back down again, and it no longer satisfies the horizontal line test. So let's get rid of all this stuff, all this stuff. And let's restrict our domain to being just between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So this is y is equal to the sine of x, restricted here. And of course, this goes up to 1 and down to negative 1. So if we graph the inverse, it's going to do just the opposite. It's going to look something like this, where this value now is 1. And this value now is negative 1. This goes up to pi over 2. And this goes down to negative pi over 2. OK? And we can do the same thing. We can say, oh, well, the sine of pi over 6 is equal to, do you remember? Here's pi over 6 right here. The sine of that is one half. So that means that the arc sine of one half is 
pi over 6. Similarly, the sine of uh, what? Of uh, pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2. So the arc sine of square root of 2 over 2 is equal to pi over 4. You're always looking for an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Let's try one more. I need to remind myself what the sign looks like for this one. I want this thing right here. That's going to be a negative pi over 3. So the sign of negative pi over 3, we call that the sign, that's the y coordinate. That's going to be negative square root of 3 over 2. And so what does that mean? That means that the arc sign of negative square root of 3 over 2 is equal to negative pi over 3. Again, you're just asking for the angle whose sign is this. What's the angle whose sign is this? And I'm always looking for an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. What's the angle whose sign is this? Okay, that's all there is to it. So that should do it for the inverse trig functions. And uh, that does it as far as inverses are concerned. In the next lesson, we talk about the exponential function and logarithm, its inverse. And, um, and then we go on into limits, which is where calculus really starts. That's it.